My name is Colette Mazzuccelli. In the Classical Theories and Contemporary Issues in International Relations online seminar, taught by me for Long Island University Global since 2015, it is our responsibility in service to transnational civil society during this unprecedented time of COVID-19 to listen to non-governmental organizations, notably the Syrian Emergency Task Force, which accomplishes political, economic, and legal work to raise awareness about the most pressing, critical humanitarian issue of this early 21st century. We appreciate the occasion to launch this podcast series, Global Connections, Syrian Hidden Voices, to discuss the ways in which the Syrian Emergency Task Force is engaging across countries to bring hope, hope to the orphans, the displaced, the women, the detainees in Syria. Our learning, research, and service aim to make a difference in a fragile world impacted increasingly by the novel coronavirus pandemic, which exacerbates underdevelopment and violence as personal freedom and human rights are consistently violated. It is our hope that the peoples of Syria may one day be able to live in peace together in the country they love. As we study international relations, we take responsibility in our learning to link concepts and practice in the vision of world education articulated by Morris Mitchell and elaborated by his colleagues in Friends World College during the 1960s to this day. In this podcast series, we remain faithful to Mitchell's vision as the legacy of Friends World College lives on in the lives of our LIU Global alumni. Thank you, Muaz and Omar, for joining this podcast today. We look forward to our evolving cooperation with the Syrian Emergency Task Force in this Global Connections Syrian Hidden Voices podcast series. Welcome back to Global Connections Syrian Hidden Voices. I'm your host, Olivia Stevens, bringing you this episode today. We welcome back Moaz Mustafa and Omar al Shogre and thank them profusely for the opportunity to create this project. If you haven't heard our last two episodes with them about the beginnings of the Syrian Revolution and the Syrian Emergency Task Force, as well as the extremely powerful story of Caesar and the Caesar Files, now would be a great time to go back and listen to those. In this episode, Juliana poses the question of how can people get involved and what is the responsibility of everyday people to get involved in global issues and humanitarian crises such as in Syria. Again, a huge thank you to Maria Zuniga and Juliana, to the Syrian Emergency Task Force, to Omar al Shogre and Muaz Mustafa, to Colette Mazzuccelli, and to the students in classical theories and contemporary issues in international relations. Without each and every one of you, this podcast would not be possible. A big thank you to you, dear listener, for being present. Welcome to the podcast. What do you believe needs to happen so that everyday people, governments, and countries shift their mindsets from a national one to a global one where human rights are viewed as a global concern instead of a local one that way inspired action beyond our current borders? So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. I believe today's leadership is based on economy and politics. It's not based on human rights. And I believe we're doing great mistakes, big mistakes, when we when we elect somebody and we let them work for four or five years to the next election time without following their actions. And then we that because that's impacting our our society, our system, our laws, our everything without us noticing what's going on. We just believe this person would be a good fit for this four years, so we elect them, and in four years they work and they may destroy a lot without us noticing what's going on. So if I answer if I answer this question in a different way, I think that like what we need to do today is to understand that we only involving really small groups of this world to solve the problem in Syria. We excluding a lot of companies, a lot of individuals, a lot of human of of giving their opinion, your 
their suggestions about how to solve the war in Syria. So what we do is human rights organ human rights organization and polit politicians are working to end the killing in Syria. Let's say as an example, we excluding a lot of companies, business companies, um, uh, consulting companies that have a lot of brilliant minds. We can't say how many people who have been studying at Columbia or Harvard or people who've been working very hard to to, uh, to to get a job in the world working on, how many of those people are working on solving the, the, the world problems, including war and conflict in Syria? Very, very few. The majority goes to, to companies where they can earn a lot of money and it's not a human rights or a human rights organization. It's not politics, right? So we need to find a way where we can get those people to be involved. We need to get businesses to be involved in the solution um, and finding a way for the solution uh, for the conflict in Syria. Um, because the war in Syria started based on corruption and economy. And we can't just solve it by human rights people. Uh, we need to solve it by people who understand business and corruption. And it's not always uh, politicians who do that. So we need to get um, all kind of businesses and all kind of people involved to solve the problem in Syria. Thank you, Omar. And, and just to, it's a great question, right? You know, first of all, how do we become more globally focused and aware of what's happening elsewhere? Um, and, and how do we get action, um, you know, to, to protect human beings, which I think is, is you know, the most important thing um, out there. And, and number one, today the world is a lot more interconnected than it was before. Like before something could happen elsewhere and it took forever to get the news about it, and, and th in terms of how do we get people, uh, you know, we look more globally and, and, and less just inwards or, or domestically and, and how um, we can get action um, by governments and, and by people in general to, to protect human life, especially when there are atrocities and genocidal massacres that are unfolding. Today, we have the ability to hear about atrocities right away, right? For example, um, today with technology, uh, for example, our organization has an app called Syria Watch where in Northwest Syria, this is a place where 4 million people, a million of them are children, are in an ever-shrinking space, being attacked by the Russian Air Force and the Assad regime and Iranian-backed militias and just horrible forces that are bombarding them and, and they're, the border is closed, they can't go anywhere. So what we're doing is we're tracking these attacks on civilians in that area. So every time there's an attack on civilians, uh, this app, Syria Watch, will notify you. It's a free app, everyone can download it. And, and just education, learning about what's happening elsewhere, I think that's the most important first step. I can speak as an American that the majority or almost all the American people, at least in my life experience, Republicans and Democrats growing up in Arkansas and living in Washington, D.C. and, and St. Louis, truly humanitarians, like they, they really care if, if they learn about something uh, you know, is especially like someone like them that may be hurt or, or, or could be in trouble. They do everything to help, regardless of their politics. And so education is key because when people know and learn about these atrocities and also learn about the people, that, not that they're just numbers, but they're real people with real stories, they can relate and then they care. And we live in democracies. Um, and so we have an obligation because our governments are actually thank God, accountable to us. Um, and we can move them with our votes, with our you know, advocacy, with our letters, et cetera. Um, and in the United States, more so than any other country, it is even more of an obligation for us to be educated global citizens, because that's, I think, part of what would make us Americans, a country of immigrants from all over the world, and a country that's seen as sort of a shining light, a place where the Syrian people went out in protest because they want to live in a place where they can have the same rights we have here. For example, the United Nations is unable to act due to vetoes in the Security Council by a single country, even if you have consensus by others. The world looks towards us for leadership in terms of what do we do about this conflict or this issue, et cetera. And that's why it's such an obligation for us to educate ourselves on what's happening elsewhere, because once we do and we have the tools in this day and age to do it, it makes, uh, then, then, then we know, you know, 
that this is something to bring up and this is an issue that should be discussed and, and resolved. And, and our country has the ability to help and lead the world um, in bringing a political solution to Syria. Um, number two, if we look outside of just the humanitarian atrocities, right, it is our values of human rights and no torture and no killing of civilians and no targeting of hospitals and schools. That's something we believe in. It's part of, of our values. Um, but even if we look strictly at the national interests and strategic interests, um, when it, you know, if you leave horrendous crimes ongoing, atrocities happening, and we ignore them because that's not our problem. If that long enough develops and becomes our problem, biggest example is the rise of ISIS. ISIS is a symptom of the Assad regime. It's manipulation of extremists. It's killing of, of you know, Democrats and moderates and, and the people. And it's an inaction of the world to his crimes, the green light for him to use chemical weapons and others that created vacuums in Syria and areas that are uh, in strife. And so terrorists like ISIS, they were able to exploit that vacuum. And then they became a threat to us and to the region and to the Syrian people, first of all, who they killed more than anyone else. Right. And so because we we sort of ignore that long enough, um, I think humanitarian atrocities become sort of, uh, you know, national security challenges that, that then make us less safe at home. So both from the right thing to do and in our national interests, um, you know, we, we they align when it comes to helping bring an end to the atrocities in Syria. So that's something that I think is also important to point out and understand. Uh, and I think that will allow for for more action for us to think as a government as well, you know, not you know about what's going on elsewhere and, and what is our responsibility to, for to, to help. That was excellent. Thank you so much, Omar and Moaz, for those testimonies for all of this just really important information that you have given us today. On behalf of the LIU Global Community, the Going Global Podcast, and the Syrian Emergency Task Force, we thank you, dear listener, for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed today's episode, and we'll leave you with Syrian music thanks to producer James Mirabello.